Please be seated. Well, good morning and welcome to our worship this morning. A warm welcome too to visitors who are with us this morning. I know we've got some visitors, uh, Andrew and his wife Kathy, who are actually, Andrew was a contemporary of mine at New College, which is further back than either of us would like but, to remember, but uh, visiting from London, Ontario. So a warm welcome and, and to other visitors who might be with us today. Uh, and an invitation to come for refreshments, uh, which are served outside the hall at the close of our worship. Now, the church notices are, are all there as, as printed. I would just like to add the following. On Friday evening, uh, Christchurch Youth had a very successful film night, um, pizza and film night. It was uh, pizza and uh, Finding, Finding Dory was the, was the film. Um, over 70 attended, uh, and uh, part of its purpose was to at least just break even in costs. It actually raised $550. So well done to all those who were organizing that. Um, you'll see work is progressing on the restoration of the church. The scaffolding and the tower is now complete. And work will progress as, as funds are available. And thanks to all those who have already contributed to, to the restoration. This week, Wednesday evening at 7.30 uh, in the West Hall, our study group continues. Uh, last Wednesday, we looked at the story of Abraham. And this Wednesday, it will be the story of, of Jacob. Now, the church directory, as you're perhaps aware, that's in the process of um, being prepared. If you haven't already signed up for an appointment for your photograph to be taken, could you please do so at the close of worship? Uh, Pat Lang is, is going to be in the hall and uh, with the timetable of uh, available appointments. So please see Pat. And could I say, even if you're a bit shy about having your photograph taken, could you uh, indicate at least that you would uh, like to be involved in the directory in terms of your name and address and telephone number, which it's a very helpful uh, document. And final intimation, the Bermuda Overseas Mission are this summer planning a return trip to Malawi. So that'll be this summer to Malawi. And on Thursday evening at 6.30 in the hall, David Thompson will be giving a presentation on some of the details in terms of timings and costs and so on and so forth, which uh, he describes a trip to Malawi as being a, a life-changing experience, and certainly having visited the country on a couple of occasions, uh, it is quite an experience to go and, and meet folks there. That's Thursday evening at 6.30. Let us worship God. Let us sing to His praise at Him 201. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, Him 201.
You know the generosity of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather this day with your whole church to offer you our worship and our praise. Hidden God, we worship you. Hidden because by ourselves we could not know you, for human wisdom does not discover you, nor argument lead to you, nor enterprise reveal you. In the wealth of its information and knowledge, the world fails to find you. Yet you came to search for us in the frailty of a human life, and you trusted yourself to the fragile faith of wavering disciples. And so we praise you that it is in our very weakness that we can know you, and that stumbling stocks become, blocks become stepping stones, and the foolishness of the cross, the very truth that awakens us to life. And yet we confess, O God, that rather than the, your ways of humility and service, it is power and status which so often attracts us as the world boasts of its cleverness and at times clings to knowledge and information not only as a means of power but as a way to belittle others, oppress them and take advantage of them. And so we ask your forgiveness. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. O hidden God, your wisdom unsettles our values but also compels our love. Fill us with a desire to search for your truth, that truth which we find in the prophets of old, the saints of the church, but above all in the life and the service of Christ and of his cross, a cross with the power to surprise us and to transform our lives and this, your world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The boys and girls that we have like to come out to the front for a bit and have a word with them. It's lovely to see you all. Did you enjoy the film night? Did you have a good time? Yes, got some pizza? And cookies, good day. Well, it's lovely to see you. All. Lovely to see you here today. Out you come. There we are. Now, have we got any young tennis players amongst you? Yes, just the one tennis player. You play tennis as well. Any older tennis players? Yes, we've got some tennis players. Ex tennis players. Ex tennis players. Do you have any favourite tennis player? Roger. Roger Federer. Now, did you catch the news this morning? Am I giving something away here? Yeah. You don't want to know then, the rest of you. Yeah. <laughs> You've taped it. Just close your ears for a minute then. <laughs> I won't spoil it for you. I won't spoil it for you. But Roger Federer, he was in the final, wasn't he, of the Australian Open. And he was playing, well, what was in Australia, night time, but just this, this morning here. And a lot of people think, seem to think it was very surprising that he was in the final. Because, you know, he's 35. He's very old, apparently. <laughs> right? He's 35. And if he were to win, he's the second oldest player to have won a major competition like that. The other one being a man called Ken Rosewell, who you won't know of or remember, but I'm sure some of the congregation just, just might. Just might. Okay. So, whoever wins, <laughs> having to be terribly careful here for <laughs> whoever wins, whether it be Roger Federer, Rafael Nadal, whoever wins, because the two of them are similar in some ways, I'm quite sure they'll win for a number of reasons. Right, apart from being great tennis players, both of them. Both have been coming back from injury. They missed a, quite a bit of last year because they were injured. 
And I'm quite sure they'll say they've won because of a lot of hard work that they've done to get over their injuries and to get fit again. And I think they'll also thank the team that helped them, their doctors and their physios and their trainers and all the people who coached them because they're, they're these kind of people. They'll say, that's, that's, why we've, that's why we've won, whoever the winner was. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's why we've won. But you know, not all athletes do that. Not all athletes do that. I've heard athletes who are runners, sprinters, or middle distance runners, or long distance runners, or marathon runners, and I've heard golfers, and I've heard others suggest that they've won their particular competition because they've been blessed, right? They feel they have been blessed. And what we're going to be talking about later in church today is that whole idea about being blessed. And it means, it means having God's favor, right? Enjoying God's favor. And one of the problems I have with sprinters or runners or tennis players or golfers or anyone else saying, well, we won or I won because I had God's favor, is it makes me wonder, what about the opponent or the other runners? What do you think? Do you think that seems right? Do you think God would pick out one to win and not bother about the others? No, I think you're right. I don't think he does. It doesn't mean that it's not the way he works, and that's not what having God's favor means. So when these people win events, whether it be tennis or golf or running or whatever, when they win, really at the end of the day, it's down to their hard work and their skills, because God's favor means something else. But it's something we ask for each Sunday, and we ask for it for you. Because when we leave after the children's hymn, we all keep standing and we say a blessing, a blessing on our children as they go to CCY. And that blessing means that we hope that in the days ahead and the week ahead, you'll find God's favor and find out what that means. And God's favor you find if you try and live in the ways that Jesus taught us. We're going to sing now the hymn 212. 212. Morning has broken like the first morning. Here we are. Remain standing for the blessing on the children. Loving God, as our children go from here, may they go with your blessing. May they know your favor and know your joy and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear the word of God, proclaimed in the Old Testament. The first reading is from the book of Micah, chapter 6, from verse 1 to verse 8. 
You'll find it on page 866 of the Old Testament in your pew. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, please your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and your enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what I shall come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high, Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. The second reading is from Corinthians chapter 1, from verse 18 to 25. You'll find it on page 166. Apologize, I lost it. Christ, the power and wisdom of God. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Amen. The anthem is Think on These Things.
Our gospel reading for today is the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5 and at verse 1. St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5 and at verse 1, the the Beatitudes. You can follow it at page 4 in your pew Bibles, although I'm going to read this morning from the old King James Version of the of the Bible. I'm sure the Beatitudes are familiar to you in that form. And seeing the multitudes, Jesus went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. May God bless to us the reading of his word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. Hymn 485, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Hymn 485.
May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. I've mentioned before that in preparation for worship, I use the, the lectionary, uh, the lectionary which over a three-year period uh, gives a cycle of readings over the three years, a reading for each Sunday from the Old Testament, from the Psalms, from the Epistles, and from the Gospel. And over that three-year period, a large part of Scripture is actually covered. And the way it's done is, is thematic. There are should appear to be a, a theme for the day from these four readings. It's sometimes more obvious than others. Uh, sometimes it's not obvious at all, and so you just choose one of the passages and go with that. But today, I would suggest the theme, the theme is rather obvious in that it contrasts the way of the world, the way of mankind, and the wisdom of mankind with the ways of God. And the wisdom of God, or as it was described in Paul's letter, even the foolishness of, of God. And so we start by looking at the passage from the prophet Micah. He lived at the end of the 8th century to beginning of the, of the 7th century, and he was from the southern part of the kingdom. He was from Judah. And a lot of his polemic is against the people of Judah and Samaria for their falling away from God's ways, and has happened throughout the history of the monarchy, tending to worship not only their one God, Yahweh, whom they are called to worship, but worship other gods as well. And so he criticizes them for this and warns of the coming devastation and their invasion from the Assyrians. But in today's passage, the short passage we read today takes the form of almost a, a court case. And it's a case with in a sense, God prosecuting and the, the people of Judah and Israel in the, in the dock. And it begins in a surprising way because, in a sense, the people are not criticized for their wrongdoing and their failures. Instead, they're just asked to remember all that was done for them. God says, why have you grown weary of me and fallen from my ways? Have you forgotten all to have done for you through the centuries? from their escape from slavery in Egypt, their wanderings in the wilderness, their entry into a new land, the leaders that they had been given. Have you forgotten all of that? And so that first part of the, of the passage is a sort of indictment, a court case, the, their forgetfulness of all that has been done for them. And the response takes a different form. It was the custom that if you went to the temple to make sacrifice or to offer prayers, you would ask of one of the authorities, one of the priests there, for direction as what, as what you should do. And in this case, that practice is taken up, but instead of it being someone going to worship in the temple and asking of the, one of the priests in charge, one of the temple authorities, it's the people themselves before God asking what they should be doing. And asking has to be said in a very sort of ironic um, almost sarcastic way, just as the temple worshiper would ask the priest what was required of them in the sacrifice they're about to make, so the people now ask of God in this ironic way what is required of them. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Or will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? with ten thousands of rivers of oil. In other words, what's, how much is going to be enough here? And then finally, reflecting the practice of some of the countries round about who practice child sacrifice, they ask, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What is it, the Lord asks of me, in a sense asking, how much sacrifice is enough sacrifice? How much should we bring before the temple? A year old calf, thousands of rams, or indeed our firstborn? And they receive the answer. But it doesn't, in a sense, take up the question. It answers quite differently. The answer is simply this. He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness, and to walk humbly 
with your God. To walk humbly with your God is not a third requirement, it simply sums up the first two, to do justice and to love kindness, and in so doing, therefore, to walk humbly with your God. That's what's required of the, of the people when they ask what it is that is needed of them. And then we turn to that f- famous passage in Matthew's Gospel, the Beatitudes. And it's probably best known to us in Matthew's form. It's somewhat, it's quite significantly different in the Gospel of St. Luke. It seems to be different in the place where it was delivered. In Matthew, it's the Sermon on the Mount. It's on the, it's on the hillside. In Luke's Gospel, we're told it was a, a level place. But in both instances, the disciples and the, and the crowds were there. And in fact, in the Galilee now, there's a very beautiful church, the Church of the Beatitudes, which sits just up above Capernaum, and from the front of it, you can look down onto the, the peace and the tranquility of the, of the Sea of, of Galilee. And within it, round the walls, are, the, are all the Beatitudes, um, built in the 1930s. And I have to say, I, I do have one significant reservation about it, and that is that the, the architect who designed it was commissioned by Mussolini. And so that is a fairly significant reservation. But nevertheless, um, it is a, a beautiful church and a, and a beautiful uh, location. Because the Beatitudes have been the source of, of much humor as well over the, over the years in terms of the response to them and the, and the questioning of them. I'm sure you'll have seen yourself in reference to, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And then someone adds below, that is if the rest of us don't mind. And, and at the same time, you know, blessed are the poor, as it is in Luke's gospel, blessed are the poor. And I think it was Bob Hope who said, I've known what it is to be poor, and I've known what it is to be rich, and it's better to be rich. But that was Bob Hope. What, what do we make of, of these Beatitudes? I can't cover them all in one sermon, but it seems to me there's a couple of things that perhaps I'd want to, to draw to your attention. The first is this, blessed are the are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the second one I would like to look at is um, this rather challenging one. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. But let's begin with blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As I say in Luke's account, it's simply blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that, in fact, reflects one of the main thrusts of of Luke's gospel, and that is God's concern for the poor and the marginalized and the the dispossessed, and that is, of course, a a genuine and a a real concern. But in Matthew's gospel, we find, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's nowhere in the scriptures do you find poverty being offered as an ideal. Quite the reverse. Those who are forced to live in poverty in Old Testament times and the times of Jesus himself were a great concern for him. There was no suggestion that a life of poverty was an ideal situation. Poverty in Old Testament times and in Jesus' time was a hard, hard life with often little or no support from the community. And as such, the prophets would inveigh against it and say, this is, this is not the way that they should be allowed to, to live. They should be supported. They should be assisted. What we have here is, blessed are the poor in spirit. An interesting thing about the Beatitudes is that the way they're written, they should be, they should be taken in, in parallel. And just imagine them kind of side by side. And parallel to, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, is the Beatitude, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So think of these two in parallel. Poor in spirit is essentially about humility, as is meekness. Meekness is not weakness, right? To be meek is not to be weak. In fact, in Judaism, it's suggested that the meekest of all the people in the history of Judaism was Moses. And I'm sure we don't imagine him or think of him as in any sense a weak character. And remember the, the call the invitation to, to communion, 
when we celebrate Holy Communion. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. I am meek and lowly in heart. Meekness is not weakness. It's about humility. And in humility, one is open to the the ways and the promptings of God. And of course, in Jesus' teaching, to whom does that contrast? On the one side, you have those whom he's identified as the poor in spirit, the meek, the humble, the questing perhaps. On the other hand, you've got the so-called righteousness and perhaps at times arrogance of the Pharisees and those who wield religious authority. So he's making a comparison between, between the two, the poor in spirit, the meek, the humble, as against the arrogant and the know-it-alls, those who are perhaps less open to God's promptings and indeed to His ways. And yet this is perhaps even more challenging. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, it's a Scripture sentence with which we very often open a funeral or a memorial service for the sake of those who have lost loved ones. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. But in fact, in so doing, while it may be helpful and justified, it is actually taking it out of context. And if you're unsure about that, think on this. Think about what, as I was saying to the children, being blessed means. It means actually either being infused with holiness or having found God's favor. Being infused with holiness or finding God's favor. And think of those who have been bereaved in in themselves in that position of bereavement. Would they describe themselves in their mourning as having found God's favor? As they go through that experience of, of absence and indeed desperation, would they regard themselves as having found God's favor, as somehow being infused with His holiness? And the reason that it's taken out of context is, is simply this, because if you look at such references in the Old Testament to mourning and to people mourning, why are they mourning? They're mourning because of the lack of justice they see in their society, and they mourn for a just and a fairer society. That's the context of it. Blessed are those who mourn, and they're mourning about the lack of justice and fairness in the society that they see round about them. And that goes in parallel, of course, with the text. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And now you see the proper context of it. Those who mourn because of the way society seems structured and those who are suffering. And those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who want to see an end to such injustice. If we think of it in the context of the individual who is mourning the loss of of loved ones. Then think of it too, last week, Friday, saw Holocaust Memorial Day, when remembered are the deaths of six million Jews and they chosen the liberation of the horrors of the Auschwitz concentration camp. Think of the horrors of that time, the six million Jews and the, the others that were sent to the gas chambers under the Nazi regime. Found favor with God, blessed, in their mourning? No. But mourning, yes, because of the horror that they see round about them, the slaughter of innocent men, women, and youngsters. Mourning for the lack of justice and desiring righteousness. To them, they will be comforted. And to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. And so when you're reading the Beatitudes, take them in that context, take them as parallels. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The pure in heart were those who lived righteous lives, who were indeed merciful. These are the ones who will find their aspirations and their hopes met. And finally, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Children of God are those, in a sense, who inherit the characteristics and the traits of their fathers, just as children themselves often do. What characteristic or trait did they inherit here? His peacemaking, his reconciliation, 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God, just as God himself is peacemaker. And in parallel with that, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Peacemaking so often comes with a cost, a very real cost, as we see it indeed in the cross and in the crucifixion. So the Beatitudes, that suggestion of, of those who are blessed, those who are indeed infused with the holiness of God, those who have found God's favor, not perhaps those who are recognized as having found favor in terms of the values and the ordering of our world. And so the Beatitudes, a radical preaching, which turns the world's values very much upside down. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hymn 268. Hymn 268, O God of Bethel, by whose hand thy people still are fed. Hymn 268. Let us offer now our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give thanks that your ways are the ways of humility and gentleness, and the ways of reconciliation and grace, and the ways of justice and peace. We give thanks too that we are privileged as members of your church called to live in those same ways, to be humble and gentle, to be gracious and reconciling in our relationships, and called to work for justice and peace in our relationships with others and in the life of this, your world. 
And we give thanks for the prophets of old and the saints of the church who have shown us these ways. But above all, for the life of Christ and for his life of reconciliation, for his teaching and example. We thank you too for the love that we are privileged to receive and to return each day and for the support in our daily lives of friends and neighbors. And thank you too for the fellowship and communion of your church and of this congregation. We give thanks that we are able to share our joys and celebrations, but share too our sadnesses and losses, sharing in each other's lives and supportive of one another. And in your name now, we offer our prayers for others. We pray for our families and friends, wherever they may be this day, and ask for your blessing upon them, that they may know your favor and your peace and your joy in their lives, and learn of your ways. We pray too for those that we know by name and whom we know to be in need at this time, those in hospital, those receiving treatment, those recovering from treatment and from illness, but remembering too those whose illnesses know no cure, dependent on the support of others, and for them and their families we pray for the blessing of your peace. We pray for all who govern us who are in positions of power and trust and responsibility. In the use of that power, may they learn of your wisdom and your ways. May they seek to humbly serve. And together with them, may we work for a community and a society which is more just and fair. May all of us live lives of honesty and integrity as we seek to follow in your ways. And we pray for those who are the victims of the injustice and lack of peace in this our world. On this Sunday, we reflect still on the horrors of war and the slaughter of the holocausts, of human beings' hatred one to another and the horror of these times. We pray who, for those who are the victims of violence today, the millions of refugees forced to flee war and civil war and violence and seek a new home, a place of welcome. And we remember too in our prayers those who suffer our inability to share the rich and plentiful resources of this, your world with insufficient this day for themselves and for their families. May we commit ourselves to working where we can for a greater peace and a greater justice. And so we pray not just for ourselves, but for your whole church, that in the life of your church, others may learn of your blessing and of the blessing all that that requires a greater care, a greater welcoming, a greater openness to those in our world in need at this time. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue our worship with the giving of our offering.
Let us pray. Almighty God, in your name we dedicate this, our offering, praying that it may be a symbol of our commitment to live in your ways and to work for the signs of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together now and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In 518, lift up your hearts, we lift them, Lord, to thee. In 518. And now go in peace, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and always. Mm -hmm.